Hello and welcome. I'm getting audio on my side. I'll wait for the thumbs up from the wife. Okay, good to go. Hi, everyone. So as you may remember, I'm trying to do this sort of floating head in the sky intro thing. Uh, so, you know, for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park and explore together. This week we're exploring Virgin Islands National Park. Ta -da. We'll also vote near the end on the next national park we'd like to explore together. So look out for that and other posts coming in the chat as we fly around. Also, if you have thoughts or questions as we're going, feel free to post them. I love hanging out with you all and chatting about different things. So, uh, so whatever's on your mind, feel, feel free to. Small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this at home. I've also researched the park in preparation and uh, uh, researched a couple of related topics. To help, and then I'll <laughs> let me restart that. I've researched the park and prepar uh, researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wiki Wikipedia pages. I use Wikipedia because it makes sure the facts here are cited and are checked by others, and it gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour together. To that end, if you notice anything missing or that should be clarified, please help improve the Wiki pages. As the Wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore uh, Virgin Islands National Park. Smooth transition. Yeah, look at that. Okay, let me get rolling here. So I saw a couple of few folks lined up on the uh, on the end there. Let me quick turn around. Oh, hello, hello. Uh, okay, so I'll uh, I'll do a takeoff roll here real quick, and then we'll get ourselves going. A couple of small administrative updates. I posted the flight plan today in the official Microsoft events forums. Uh, so hello to everyone who saw the event there. We typically what we'll do for the live stream here is I'll talk about a couple of different uh, topics and then folks will chat in the in the Twitch chat for whatever kinds of um, thoughts or ideas you have as we're going around. I know a lot of other Microsoft fly-ins will use sort of a, a voice channel in Discord for communication or that sort of thing. Um, I'm totally open to adding something like that. Uh, it'll take a little bit of figuring out how to make the, the two blend together okay. But if folks are interested, uh, feel free to post uh, post thoughts in, in either the Twitch channel or on Discord, and we'll see what we can do for uh, future weeks. The other thing to know for today, Fractals, our friendly neighborhood moderator, is out on vacation. So have a nice vacation, Fractals, and, uh, and I'll be doing both the moderation and the uh, streaming. So wish me luck. All right, let's get ourselves on course here. This is a beautiful little island, and it's basically hidden from the horizon if you don't know what you're looking for. Kind of pop out, we can look. A lot of folks much better at getting on course than I am. So I'll be hand flying, although uh, the flight plan gets checked for um, for autopilot as well. So if you prefer autopilot, it's a pretty nice, a nice, um, visually pleasing sort of flight, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Mad Whistling Girl likes funny hair, thanks. Hey, Captain Carl. What's up? Nice to meet you. I can't VR and type in the chat. Yeah, Schmitty. The the VR and typing. That was actually that was what came up last week was folks were saying I'd really like to, but I can't um I can't do both of these two. Let me trim myself better here. Alright. So we are on our way. Let me post up this first hole here, and this is the other thing, uh, Schmitty, that starts to be a little bit tricky with this, is we'll do polls throughout, so if you are able to do it through the VR, great, if not, then uh, no worries. Just sort of fun. You'll, you'll see, let's we'll see. All right, so our first poll here. Have you ever been to this national park? Uh, yes, in the last 10 years, yes, once upon a time, or not yet. Well, folks are voting on that. The park purpose statement is a part of the National Parks Foundation document that kind of describes why the park exists. So I often read the park purpose statement at the beginning. It kind of sets the stage for, for the national park. So for Virgin Islands National Park, the purpose of Virgin Islands National Park is to preserve and protect for public benefit and inspiration, outstanding scenic features, Caribbean, tropical, marine, and terrestrial ecosystems in their natural conditions, and cultural her heritage from pre-Columbian from pre-Columbian through Danish colonial times. 
So it's a mix of sort of this tropical uh, ecosystems that we encounter, as well as a lot of cultural heritage. We'll touch a little bit on the cultural heritage, but there's way more than we can get into. And one of the topics for today actually uh, could have been sugar plantations, which there's a whole history on the island. Virgin Islands National Park uh, is a national park that preserves about 60% of the land of St. John uh, Island in the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as more than 5,500 acres of adjacent ocean and nearly all of Hazel Island, just off of the uh, St. Thomas Harbor. So we'll fly over that just in the end. Okay, looks like we got about, we got a pretty good spread here. So we have one yes in the last 10 years, one yes once upon a time, and one not yet. Very cool. I have not been to Virgin Islands National Park. I do need to go. Uh, it sounds much like a lot of these parks as I research more, uh, I, my desire to go increases. Uh, but this is a particularly cool one. I've, oh, new, <laughs> okay, got it. So we have more people have not gone, yeah. Flying Singer to the actual Virgin Islands, but not a national park. 1976, cool. Yeah, the BVIs are right over. So we're actually going to fly in uh, past a couple of islands here, and then we'll hit the national park last. So let me show you the flight plan just a little bit here. The other piece of it that's useful to know about the national park is where it is in relation to some other items. So this is Puerto Rico here. And then I'll tell you what, let me turn on this so you can see some of these labels. So there's Puerto Rico. And then if I keep zooming out here, you can kind of see where we are relative to the United States. So we're quite a ways away from the mainland now. Nice little gem out in the ocean to go and see. The other thing that the park is known for is scuba diving and snorkeling, and it has miles of hiking trails through different tropical forests excuse me, different tropical rainforests. Cruise Bay is the gateway port to the park, as well as the visitor center location. The ferries operate from various nearby ports, so if you do want to go and visit, you can take a ferry from one of the ports into, the, into Cruise Bay. Another important thing to know, two Category 5 hurricanes impacted the Virgin Islands in September of 2017. This is Irma and Maria. The park was reopened in December of 20. Uh, in December of 2017, so this is months later, with all roads, trails, and beaches declared accessible to visitors. So it was a big community effort to make the park, to open it back up just a couple of months later. Uh, but the hurricane impact was a pretty big deal there. There's a nice video, so I'll, I'll, for those of you who are new, I try to find park videos from the park itself, videos and resources from the national parks. And sometimes they'll have nice kind of overview videos and cheesy ones, sometimes, you know, how the park forms sort of thing. So this video is with Ranger Corinne, and she talks through boating in the park. It's not the normal sort of park summary, but it ends up being a really good overview uh, since you get to see a lot of the bays, the reefs, the visitor center, and there's a bunch of other interesting elements about the park that, that she covers. That said, it's definitely a bit cheesy. So if you're like me and like that kind of thing, then, uh, then prepare to smile because it's kind of a, a fun little video. Let me pull that up real quick. This is the checkers game where grandson and granddad will bond. Welcome to the US so we're going to make sure my airplane is trimmed. Okay. All right. Welcome to the US Virgin Islands, a boater's paradise. My name is Kilan and I'm from the Virgin Islands. And I'm Corinne, one of the park rangers here. Your national park is a rich and delicate ecosystem, both on land and at sea. This is what makes your national park awesome. Today, there are over 400 sites throughout the country that are protected by the National Park Service. Two of them are located here on St. John. There's Virgin Islands National Park and Virgin Islands Coral Reef National Monument. Both of these sites are nationally significant, and they were created for you to enjoy, to explore, to have adventures, and to learn about these special ecosystems. They are protected for future generations to enjoy. When you are out there exploring and having fun, you have to keep your eyes and ears open. I always be scanning the surface of water and looking ahead for navigational markers. Remember, the things we need to look out for may be the hardest things to see. 
Coral reefs are endangered. They take centuries to grow and are a vital part in our planet's ecosystem. They can also endanger a person and destroy a boat. So be careful when in doubt, go farther out. There are different color marine balls and the color white is for recreation boaters. Picking up a marine can take a little practice. So go slow and look pro. I will attach a marine line to the bow, not the stern. Storm marine is not allowed in the national park. Just because there is a marine ball doesn't mean it is safe to swim. There might be a dangerous current. Just because you do not see a marine ball doesn't mean you can anchor. Anchoring is only allowed in three designated spots in a national park. Cruise Bay, Limpong, and Francis Bay. Be sure to stop by the National Park Visitor Center for more information. You can pay to stay overnight on a mooring at the Visitor Center or at one of our mooring pay stations. When you see our rangers on the water, be sure to say hello. And if you see trash or mooring debris, please pick it up because this keeps our waters clean. Whether you visit us here at the Visitor Center in Cruise Bay or pick up one of our maps or brochures, we have all the resources to help you have a safe and enjoyable visit. We even have an interactive Google Earth map online that will help you enjoy your visit to your national park. Remember, it takes all of us to protect our coral reefs. Like that, At the end. Just a quick uh, new ranger comes in reminder about the national uh, the coral reefs. So I hope that was a nice little little uh, intro to the park. So I got to see a little bit of the bays. And we're, what we're going to do for this flight is we'll go all the way around the island once. We'll turn around. and We'll go all the way around the other way. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's a small park, so we have the time. Uh, the other reason is it, you seeing the bays from different angles. There are different things kind of pop out to you. So when I was planning it, it seemed unfair to only go one one direction around. Uh, one question that I was curious about, and I'll throw it to the chat, and I know a uh, number of folks are on VR, so it may not work, but uh, has anyone done a small plane flight over the ocean like this? Uh, so I've I've done a couple of virtual ones like like we're doing now, but I'd never, I was thinking about, it, I'd never actually flown this kind of plane where you might need like life jackets in it and um, and sort of a whole different caliber of, of general aviation. So I'm curious if anyone has any kind of experience on that. Uh, Mad Wisman Girl, the park is, I think it's about 60% of the island, so it's most of the island. And it's interesting, actually, you'll see when we fly over it that you can tell pretty distinctly in the game and also in, in real life where the park is and isn't, because the park is untouched and the rest of the island has uh, streets and, and houses, just kind of like what we're seeing off our left wing here. This isn't the park, but it looks kind of like that in the places where it's not the national park. Uh, there's also a small island that's kind of away near St. Thomas Island uh, that that is also part of the National Park. Just a little add-on that was that was created later. All right, let me pull up this poll real quick. So our first topic for today is hurricanes. And so the poll question here, what is the eye of a hurricane? Is it a place the hurricane basically doesn't impact with calm winds and mild waves? So vote A. Is it an area of sinking air, which uh, suppresses cloud formation and produces calm wind, or a growing point for new hurricanes, like a potato eye, or the eye of the hur hurricane? Give folks a second to vote on that one. So the connection to the park, I mentioned in the, the overview of the park that there were two Category 5 hurricanes that impacted the Virgin Islands in September of 2017. So this is Hurricane Irma which was an extremely powerful hurricane and caused widespread destruction. It was also the first Category 5 hurricane to strike this set of islands, the, the islands that the Virgin Islands are a part of, uh, at least the only one on record. And then that hurricane, Hurricane Irma, was followed by Hurricane Maria just a couple uh, weeks later. At the time, it was considered the most powerful hurricane on record to originate in the open Atlantic region, which was outside of the Caribbean Sea or outside of the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, got a little bit of variety in our votes here. 
So I'll, uh, the other hurricane is Hurricane Irma, which was uh, also a Category 5. And this was, again, a couple weeks after. I'm sorry, Hurricane Maria, a couple weeks after. Let me pull up two photos of these because they're both um, really pretty, pretty impressive storms. So there's Hurricane Irma. Then Hurricane Maria, you can see a really clear eye in both of these two. We'll pop out and look. So this is Ginger Island that we're flying over. Ginger Island's just a, a it's just a pretty island to fly over. It's not part of the park. Okay, this is where my ability to juggle. Let's see if I can do this moder moderator part two. Okay, so it looks like we have most of our votes are the second option, option B, which was the correct answer. So it's an area of sinking air which suppresses cloud formation and produces calm wind. The kind of trick question in here a little bit was that first answer has this uh, mention of mild waves. And this is something I thought was really interesting. When I, when I think of the eye of a hurricane, I think, you know, sort of no, no big destruction going on in the area around the eye and in fact what it is is there's very calm winds in the eye but the waves underneath because they they can be formed by the uh, eye wall can be pretty bad uh, it can be really really bad and so that's sort of like uh, the, the waves in the eye are actually uh, tremendously powerful once it makes landfall obviously it changes a little bit but all right so let's start at the top of the hurricanes what is a hurricane so we just saw a couple pictures of it. A, uh, a hurricane is also called a tropical cyclone. And the tropical part refers to the, the geographical origin of these systems, which form almost exclusively over tropical areas. Cyclone then refers to the winds moving in a circle, whirling around their central clear eye, with the winds blowing counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. A tropical cyclone is a rapidly rotating storm system characterized by low pressure center a closed low-level atmospheric circulation, strong winds, strong winds, and a spiral arrangement of thunderstorms that produce heavy rain and or squalls. So there's kind of four different parts of that that we'll talk about throughout the rest of the topic. Depending on the strength and location, a tropical cyclone is referred to by different names, including a hurricane or a typhoon, might be called a tro tropical storm or a cy uh, cyclonic storm, and there's a couple other ones that you might hear. A hurricane then is a tropical cyclone that occurs in the Atlantic Ocean uh, or the northeastern Pacific Ocean, and a typhoon occurs in the northwestern Pacific Ocean. Uh, tropical cyclones are typically somewhere between 60 and 1,200 miles in diameter, so they can be a huge range of sizes. You also, I mentioned a couple of times this idea of a tropical cyclone, so does that mean that there are non-tropical cy cyclones? And it turns out there are. So they're called extratropical cyclones, and or sometimes called mid-latitude cyclones or wave cyclones. So there's an example of one here forming over the Great Lakes. This is a neat little video. So we can make this slightly bigger. So what you'll see is you'll see the the extratropical cyclone starting to develop, and then uh, it it you'll see it most strongly right over the Great Lakes. So it's got that same sort of counterclockwise spiraling shape, uh, but it forms for different reasons and it behaves a little bit differently. So in particular, extratropical cyclones produce rapid changes in temperature and dew point along broad lines called weather fronts uh, around the center of the cyclone. So whereas a hurricane is more consistent around the center, uh, a cyc uh, extratropical cyclone will be much more intense. I'm sorry, not much more intense, will be, uh, will be like a front. So it's a change in temperature and dew point. Another phrase you may hear if you ever hear a nor'easter. So a nor'easter is a type of extratropical cyclone. So this is a picture of one from January of 2018. Okay, so that's tropical cyclones. I'm sorry, that's extratropical cyclones. Back to tropical cyclones. First part of, of, the, of a cyclone is how does that actually form? So they typically form over large bodies, of relatively warm water. Because of this, these storms are typically strongest when over or near water and weaken rapidly when over land. 
They derive their energy through the evaporation of water from the ocean surface, which ultimately recondenses into clouds and rain. The energy released by the condensation of moisture in the rising air causes a positive feedback loop over warm ocean waters. So in the rising and uh, con condensation of the air, that sort of uh, energy cycle starts to create a, a building motion in the hurricane. And so it looks a little bit like this, at a, just kind of a simple graphic of it. You notice they have labeled the eye wall, the tropopause, it's kind of the top part of the atmosphere here. And then these are different rain bands. So I'll pull up another photo of a, of a hurricane or a, a diagram like this. Um, but you'll see that sort of rising air condenses and then uh, that motion builds this, this, the strength of the storm builds as it, as it has more warm air there. They also draw, tropical cyclones draw an air from a large area and concentrate the water content of that air into a much smaller area. So they can pull in moisture from a, from a pretty broad region, but then they condense it right around the center. Around the world, a tropical cyclone is generally deemed to have formed once, I'm sorry, uh, a tropical cyclone is generally deemed to have formed once the mean winds are in excess of 40 miles per hour are observed. It is assumed at this stage, the tropical cyclone can become self-sustaining and continue to identify with an, without any help from the environment. So typically when they form, they need this combination of elements and with just the right mixture, then they'll start to rotate and go. Once they hit about 40 miles per hour though, they can start to build speed on their own. They don't need that, that special environment anymore. They just need warm water. So speaking of, of hurricanes forming, tropical cyclones typically form on either side of the equator and generally have their origins in what's called the intertropical convergence zone. So the intertropical convergence zone is known by sailors as the doldrums or the calms because it's got kind of a monotonous windless sort of weather. It's an area where the northeast and southeast trade winds converge. So you can actually see it if you look at the clouds across like a picture of uh, the earth. You can sometimes see the this intertropical convergence zone where those trade winds are, are meeting. So it's that band of clouds here. And you can also see then if you look at the basins where uh, tropical cyclones typically start, you'll see that they're all kind of around that same uh, intertropical convergence zone. So they all start right along the middle, right around the equator, and then they'll kind of curve off as they want to. That's often why they originate in similar places is because you get those same sorts of elements. Uh, when within this broad area of low pressure, the air is heated over warm tropical waters that rises and causes showers and builds that cycle that we talked about. Let me pull one more. Okay, so this is that other diagram that I mentioned. So this is uh, probably the most clear one that I could find. So this is the structure of the hurricane. So you have that same thing. We have the, the warm air rising up, and then we have rain bands which occur, and so you get actually these sort of banded pattern. Uh, and I'll show a picture later from Hurricane Katrina, and you'll see in the in the picture it's from from the eye of the storm. You can see some of this banding sort of sort of nature to it. Uh, for those of you in Microsoft Flight Simulator who enjoy flying around in some of these storms, I was looking for pictures of flight simmers going into hurricanes, and it looks like the game does not capture those rain bands very well. So it does capture the intensity of the storm, but um, but a little ways to go yet before we get that full hurricane simulation. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the broad strokes of hurricanes, how they form. The eye of the storm then is a particularly important piece. This is the one that we were talking about in the poll today. So at the center of a mature tropical cyclone, air sinks rather than rises. For a sufficiently strong storm, air may sink over a, deep la a layer deep enough to suppress cloud formation, thereby creating a clear eye. Weather in the eye is normally calm and free of convective clouds, although the sea may be extremely violent. So we saw a couple pictures of, of different uh, hurricane types, but let me pull up one more. So this is a really clear one. It also shows the thunderstorms that can develop around the eye wall. So this very dark sort of menacing hurricane and then just clear blue underneath. The eye is normally uh, circular and is typically between 20 and 40 miles in diameter, although eyes as small as two miles and as large as 230 miles have been observed. There's a particular effect if you ever uh, do see a hurricane up close. The eye itself curves outward as um, it curves outward from the center, and it gives this sort of look of like a like a stadium. So they call it the stadium effect. 
It's fairly common in strong topical cyclones because of the spinning vortex of, of air just kind of pulls it, pulls it back a little bit. And so I'll pull up a closer picture from the side. You can see it sort of the dome shape sort of, I'm sorry, the, the stadium shape sort of on the edges here. There are also some types of planes called hurricane hunters that are designed to fly into the eye of a hurricane. And that's how you get some pretty incredible images like this. So this is from the eye of Hurricane Katrina. You can see a little bit of the banding going on here too. Uh, for those of you who are uh, airplane, uh, I don't know, enjoy airplanes as much as I do, looking up the hurricane hunters is a pretty fun way to do it. It kind of started as a, a project for, uh, it was it was like a bunch of uh, military folks were hanging out in Texas, I believe, and they decided they were just going to fly their their well constructed planes into the eye of a hurricane and see what happened. Uh, and they made it there and back just fine. And so the the military said, "Oh, okay, well we'll start doing this professionally." And so Hurricane Hunter started. All right, so that's a little bit about how they're how they're made and what kinds of things you might see. Um, we're actually coming up into the park right now. So this is St. John's Island. And I'm going to lose a little bit of altitude here. Speaking of hurricanes, you'll notice this kind of curved shape here uh, just ahead of us. And oops, thank you. My wife's holding up a sign that says uh, you're, you're, you got your, your uh, Chrome tab still open. So this, you'll notice on the map, it's called Hurricane Hole. And so Hurricane Hole is a, a particularly well-protected harbor, and so uh, boats will come in here and, and actually stay. This is part of the reason that I wanted two hurricanes for this park. And uh, Mad Wisman Girl, to answer your question from before, you can see the houses built up here. And if you look on the park map, there's this gray area where it is not part of the national park, and it's pretty stark difference. You can see, see pretty clearly where, where the park starts and ends. Okay. So uh, we talked a bit about hurricanes, we talked a bit about how they form. The other piece about them is sort of the impact they have on the environment. So coastal damage can, uh, may be caused by the strong winds and rains and high, high strong winds and rain, high waves due to the winds and storm surges due to the wind and to the uh, severe pressure changes, as well as the potential to spawn tornadoes. This replenished, uh, this the replenishing of moisture bearing air after rain may cause multi-hour and multi-day uh, extremely heavy rain up to 25 miles from the coastline, uh, which is far beyond the amount of water that the local atmosphere holds. So the hurricane can pull in moisture from so much further away, which means that when the rain gets dropped in a particular region, it can be a, an overwhelming amount. That's why we often get floods or we'll get uh, overland flooding, river flooding, or general water control issues in, in areas where hurricanes hit. It's because they're pulling in so much moisture from outside of the local region. The last piece I'll mention on hurricanes then is about how they're classified and kind of the naming. So classified from category one to category five with five being the strongest, and that's based on the one minute stained wind speeds. So if you wanna look more into it, uh, there's a, some pretty interesting differences between different types as well as different systems used around the world. Uh, but that's the short version. So one is kind of the most mild hurricane and a five would be the most severe. And quick before I jump into the naming, let me pop out of the plane here. So if you look down on the ground, you can see there's sort of this uh, spot that looks like maybe it's buildings. It's a little bit different color, kind of right over my left wing right now. So that's called the Annaberg Sugar Mill. And the Annaberg Sugar Mill is an important uh, piece of uh, history for the park. So if you go and visit, it's supposed to be one of the more cool artifacts to go and see. So let me show a couple of pictures. Also, we'll just take a pause because this is the, the park itself is, is really pretty. So Mary Point, that the, the area we just passed, looks like this. And then the Annaberg Plantation Windmill looks like this, so some of those ruins I was talking about as well as the school there. So there's the remains of a school there as well. So when you go and visit, you can go and see all these different elements of the, of the history there. Now we're also coming up here pretty quick on what's called Honeymoon Beach. Let me pull up a picture of that one. So Honeymoon Beach is a particularly um, well-liked beach, uh, Trunk Beach being the other huge favorite. So let me pull up a picture 
and Trunk Beach is what is under us right now. So Trunk Beach is consistently voted one of the top beaches in the world. So when we go to visit the park, this is a must-see. I got another picture when we do our second lap around. I'll, uh, I'll pull up a different picture of Trunk Beach, you can see. Beautiful little area. So last piece about hurricanes is a kind of the naming. So you may know, or you may have picked up uh, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Marie, kind of named after different people. So tropical cyclones are named each year and retain their names throughout their lifetimes to provide ease of communication between forecasters and the general public regarding forecasts, watches, and warnings. The name selection comes from one of six rotating alphabetic lists of 21 names that are maintained by the uh, World Meteorological Organization uh, and the committee that they have. Also, a quick side note, that is not what Cruise Bay looks like. Um, if anyone listening has some experience with scenery improvements, this would be a great one to kind of flatten out correctly. Uh, but you, you get the, the general sense. So the visitor center is just off our left here. All right. Uh, the list itself skips the letters Q, U, I guess I could do Quebec, Uniform, X-Ray, Yankee, and Zulu. So five of the letters are not in that mix. And then it rotate, uh, and it rotates from year to year, alternating between male and female names. The names of significant tropical cyclones are retired from the list, with a replacement name selected at the next meeting of the hurricane committee. Okay, so in summary, a tropical cyclone is a rapidly rotating storm system characterized by a low pressure center, a closed low-level atmospheric circulation. That's that warm air being picked up that we talked about strong winds, and a spiral arrangement of thunderstorms that produce heavy wind and or squalls. They go by different names in different parts of the world, with hurricane referring to those in the Atlantic Ocean or the Northeastern Pacific Ocean. They gain energy through evaporation of water on the ocean surface, which ultimately recondenses into clouds and rain. The energy released by the condensation of moisture and rising air causes a positive feedback loop over warm ocean waters, which intensifies the strength of the storm. So those of you who have, oh, there. thanks, Nevada Uh So those of you who ha have uh, been to a couple of these know that I typically finish different sections off with a joke of some sort, just to kind of to kind of round things out. Uh, hurricanes are are a very real topic, though, and very dangerous and and destructive, especially in a national park like Virgin Islands National Park. Uh, so I didn't want to do a hurricane specific joke. But I figured we could make something, make fun of something at least sort of related. Uh, so why don't we choose the college football team, the Miami Hurricanes? So I have just a, a little one-liner for you. So how do you keep the Miami Hurricanes out of your front yard? Just put up goalposts. Uh, also, I had to consult a friend of mine who watches more college football than I do to make sure that that was an appropriate joke. He said that... If you have any huge Miami Hurricanes fans, they may be offended, but in general, it's an okay, it, it's reasonably accurate. <laughs> so, there you go, at least the, the outsider perspective on it. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Uh, thanks, Jess. Okay. Uh, so, let me pull up a couple of quick ones as we're rounding the corner here. So, this area is really well known for scuba diving and, uh, and snorkeling. So we'll look at some of these reefs. And like I said, we'll do a little turnaround here. This saltwater pond, this little area here, is also supposed to be famous for the mangroves. You remember we talked about mangroves in Everglades National Park. So there's really good snorkeling around the mangroves here. This is Reef Bay, which is on the south part of the island. So here's a quick little photo of it. You can kind of see. Some of the national parks, I feel like the game really captures the essence well. Uh, this is a particular one where I have to imagine going there in person is, is just hard hard to describe how, how cool it probably is. Okay, so that was hurricanes, that was our first topic, and takes us right into our second topic, which is scuba diving and snorkeling. Speaking of snorkeling in that last piece, uh, we're also coming up on what's called Round Bay and Princess Bay. So I mentioned the Hurricane Hole. We're kind of flying over that area. Okay. And now I juggle multiple tabs. Let me see. All right. So our next poll here. What is a dive plan used for? 
And for those of you who are also pilots uh, listening, it's there's some interesting parallels between uh, scuba diving and flying. Uh, so for those of you with a, a diving license, I'd be interested if you have noticed any of those same things. But I'll I'll talk a little bit as we as we go through the topic on what I I was picking up. So what is a dive plan used for? Is it showing off to friends how cool your summer vacation trip is? Just like a flight log. Uh -oh. Hey everyone, here's my flight log. Yeah. Uh, it's only red tape. Real divers just dive in. Or ensure the route is safe and doable by the divers and that equipment is ready. Give folks a second to vote on that one. As we round the park here. So while folks are voting, the connection to the park, I mentioned already that it's it's well known for scuba diving and snorkeling. And Trunk Bay, which is that bay that I mentioned was world famous one to go and visit, or, I'm sorry, is, is uh, frequently voted the best beach in the world, is one of the, uh, I'm sorry, the first underwater trail in the world. So if you go snorkeling there, you can actually follow not just trails hiking on land, but you can actually follow signposts underwater that will take you around the reef and show you things, just like a, a trail might do at another national park. It's a pretty cool idea, actually. I couldn't find any uh, Creative Commons images of the underwater trail. If you are interested, I would recommend Googling it because you'll immediately understand what it looks like. But if you're like me, picturing like actual signs and stuff, it's more like rocks with sort of inscriptions on them and kind of like plates explaining what's going on. Um, very accessible sort of thing to, to go and do. All right, so it looks like we got four votes for showing off to your friends how cool your, four votes for showing off to your friends how cool your summer vacation is. It's good. Uh, also an important part of the dive plan, and then one vote on the ensure the road is safe. Got a helicopter on your tail flying, saying you're cool. Nice flying formation. That's awesome. Yeah, if you get a good uh, a good screen grab, you should post that in Discord. It's always the the not being able to fly around with everyone is always the the tricky piece to do in the stream. Okay. So let me take that poll down. So the correct answer on this one is to ensure the route is safe and doable by the driver, uh, by the diver, excuse me, and that the equipment is ready. So much like uh, flight plan, where you want to make sure that you understand what route you're going to take and if you have everything that you need uh, for like takeoff distances, fuel requirements, those sorts of things. A dive plan is very similar in the use cases that it has. The other sort of parallel that you'll pick up right away. Oh, it also. Well, I'll talk about dive logs in, in a little bit. So. First topic, though, of these two. So we'll talk about both snorkeling and scuba diving. So what is snorkeling? You may have seen this before. So snorkeling is the practice of swimming on or through a body of water while equipped with a diving mask, a shaped breathing tube called a snorkel, and usually swim fins. In cooler waters, a wetsuit may also be worn. So this is a snorkeler, kind of snorkeling around. Use of this equipment allows the snorkeler to observe underwater attractions for extended periods with relatively little effort and to breathe while face down at the surface. Snorkeling is a popular recreational activity. It provides the opportunity to observe underwater life in a natural setting without the complicated equipment and training required for scuba diving. It appeals to all ages because of how little effort is involved. It's a great way to spend an afternoon. Snorkeling is also used by scuba divers when on the surface. In underwater sports such as underwater hockey and underwater rugby, and as part of water-based search and rescues conducted by a search and rescue team. So if you wanted to get involved in snorkeling, you need a couple pieces of equipment that were mentioned. So the full set you can see here. Okay. And so first thing you need a snorkeling for a snorkel for breathing. So there's a bunch of different shapes that you can choose. And you may also be able to get one that's mounted from the front if you'd like. From there you need the diving mask or swimming goggles for vision. And then, although they're optional, swim fins are pretty, are, are efficient, are more efficient for propulsion than just your feet, and so they're pretty common as well. You also might see long fins or monofins, uh, which look something like this. I had never seen a monofin before researching this, actually, so it's kind of a, an interesting, it's like a mermaid tail, sort of. Uh, these are used by free divers as a means of underwater propulsion, and because they do not, I'm sorry, the very long fins, the ones on the right, are used because they don't require the high frequency leg movement. This improves efficiency and helps minimize oxygen consumption. The monofin, the fin on the left, is actually used in some sports, and you can also use it for free diving if you'd like, or just swimming. But there's competitive sports using monofins. 
The other thing you might want is a, re a wetsuit or some sort of uh, dive skin or rash vest. Oops, let me make sure I'm staying on course here. I, was, I don't know if, if folks have seen that sort of like really classic carpet. I should have grabbed a photo, but it's like a, a little carpet you can get for your house and it has the streets and then you can drive the cars around the, the streets on the carpet and it's like a little... Well, I always thought crew, for whatever reason, Cruise Bay in the game looks like that carpet. It's like kind of cartoony houses and really big roads. I don't know why this particular town looks that way, but anyway, a fun observation. The other piece you might want then for snorkeling is wetsuits, dive skins, or rash vests to provide environmental protection. So things like uh, if the water's cold, if they're prone to sun sunburn, uh, marine stings and scratches, uh, those sorts of things. So the wetsuit is a garment usually made from neoprene with a kit, uh, I'm sorry, a knit fabric facing, and it is worn to provide uh, thermal insulation as well as buoyancy and protection from abrasion, and then ultraviolet exposure and stings from marine organisms. So a wetsuit sort of looks like this. And it comes in all different uh, different form factors, but generally that's the that's the look. Also, this is a great look. The about to jump over the side of a boat. You also may come across weight belts in both snorkeling and scuba diving, especially in scuba diving. Especially since the wetsuit contains small bubbles of air which make the wearer more buoyant. They typically have a quick release belt, so this one has that, that belt in the front is quick release if you need to get it off in a, in a hurry for an emergency. Let me pull up quick, so this is Trunk Bay again. So we're just passing over Trunk Bay, another angle on it. And that little K just off in the, kind of the middle of the photo here, that's where that snorkeling uh, trail is, the one I mentioned. My fun. This island worked pretty well actually for, for flying around. Uh, this is my favorite view for what it's worth. When we talk about the person of the week, we'll talk a little bit more about these, but the, the beaches over here are... Uh, well liked by the rich and famous, uh, maybe unsurprisingly. So we talked a little bit about the equipment for snorkeling. How does it work, snorkeling uh, in general? So snorkeling itself, the, the actual snorkel, what happens is the snorkeler expels water either through a sharp exhalation on return to the surface, so this is called a blast clearing. Um, if you ever have been snorkeling or scuba diving, you've probably got lessons in how to do this, so it's sort of like a, a forceful blow of air to shoot all the water out the top. The other method you can use, which I have not heard of nor tried, but sounds pretty cool, is you can tilt your head back shortly after reaching the surface and exhaling until reaching and breaking the surface. So this is called the displacement method. And then basically you kind of come up to the surface, allow the water to flow out, and then once you actually reach the surface, you just tip your head back to, to normal. A little more, honestly, a little cooler way to do it, uh, but you do risk sort of getting water back in your mouth if you do it wrong. So take it or leave it. The rest of uh, snorkeling is pretty simple. You just swim around and look at reefs, shipwrecks, fish, whatever else you want to. Okay, so that was snorkeling. There's a lot of overlap with our, our second part to this topic, which is scuba diving. So I, I was curious, has anyone been snorkeling or scuba diving in this region of the world, the BVIs or the US Virgin Islands or anywhere around here? Uh, as I was looking at the photos, it seems honestly incredible. Uh, when we did, when we went to Guadalupe Mountains, we talked about reefs, so we won't talk more about reefs today. Uh, but if you're interested to learn more, that's that's one way to find out. For this, though, we'll talk a bit about. Um, oh yeah, but I'm I'm curious if anyone if anyone has been snorkeling or, or experienced in this area. I went to the British Virgin Islands when I was much younger. Uh, I remember really clear waters. I remember getting really badly sunburnt. I remember seeing lots of fish. Uh, but I, 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 have, I now have a scuba diving license. I didn't at the time. I feel like I would appreciate it more uh, when you know what you're seeing underwater. I think it adds to the experience. Yeah, <laughs> Nevada Straits. Yeah, we did the underwater hockey. There, there's some fun, some fun sports uh, that are are just too niche for uh, for the stream. But um, but yeah, if you want to learn more, that's a pretty fun one. Uh, State Park, never okay. Snorkeling in the BBI, that's fun. Snorkeling the BBIs, BBIs are pretty. That's where I went as BBIs. 
So a lot of this equipment that you'd use for... Oh, also, we're leaving the park now, so everyone could say, Bye, Virgin Island National Park. Hello, all the other planes. I like that I can see the deliveries, actually. I feel like that usually doesn't come through so clearly. All right, so now we're heading to the small island that is also part of the national park this ha uh, has all island element so we will pull up a little picture of that but uh, pretty they don't really talk about it as a place to go when you research the park so maybe go if you'd like but so scuba so you need a little bit more equipment than you need with snorkeling so let me do let me pull up this photo so we looked at a, a scuba diver before but you can see there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on here Scuba diving is a mode of underwater diving where the diver uses an apparatus which is completely independent of a surface supply to breathe water. The name SCUBA itself is an acronym, and it stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. So SCUBA, Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. Scuba diving may be done recreationally or professionally in a number of applications, including scientific, military, and public safety roles, but most commercial diving uses surface supply diving equipment when this is practical. Uh, scuba divers engaged in armed forces uh, covert operations may be referred to as frogmen, combat divers, or attack swimmers. So how does it work? You have one or more diving cylinders that containing breathing gas at high pressure, which is supplied to the driver through a dr diving regulator. So there's the diving cylinder. And then the diving regulator controls the pressure of the breathing gas for diving. So it's pressurized in the canister. This then makes it a uh, pressure that you can actually inhale while you're diving. Like a snorkeler, a scuba diver primarily moves around using fins attached to the feet, uh, but external propulsion can also be used by a, uh, a diver propulsion vehicle or a sled that's pulled from the surface. So there's your underwater scooter diving if you ever want to go. Scuba divers are trained in procedures and skills appropriate to their level of certification by diving instructors affiliated to the Diving Certification Organization. This includes standard operating procedures for using the equipment, dealing with general hazards of underwater environment and emergency procedures, or self-help and assistance of similarly equipped divers experiencing problems. It reminds me a lot of uh, flying and flight training. It's less intensive to say the least, but it is um, pretty well done as far as what does the curriculum need to be? What does it mean to be safe? How do you look out for others? Um, Hi, uh, I do not know how to say your name. Uh, Modati, maybe? Hello. So yeah, so if you're interested in getting your scuba license, uh, definitely check it out. It's it's a fun experience. And if you liked the experience of learning to fly a plane, you probably like the experience of uh, learning to scuba dive as well. So what other things do you need to be aware of? Uh, much like flying airplanes, you'll want a dive plan. Uh, and after you dive, you want to enter it in your dive log. So the log book and then the dive plan, in my mind, kind of stand out pretty analogous to, to flying. Hey, Mo Daddy, I got it right. Awesome. Hi, welcome. We're talking about uh, scuba diving. So dive planning is to ensure that, like we talked about in the poll, dive planning is to ensure that divers do not exceed their comfort zone or skill level or the safety capacity of their equipment and includes gas planning to ensure the amount of breathing gas is sufficient to allow for any reasonable foreseen, foreseeable contingencies. Again, like an airplane, before starting a dive, both the diver and their buddy do equipment checks to make sure everything is in good working order and available. After the dive, it's considered best practice to log your dive. Professional divers may be legally obliged to, uh, but in general, it's, it's encouraged as it becomes a sort of legal document you can give for employment in the future or to prove that you're of a certain proficiency if you want to go on harder dives. We're just off the, the nose here, we have Hazel Island. So this is that small part of the National Park I mentioned. I'll pull up a quick photo here. And then I'm going to keep flying around and sort of do a, a loop back for closing out the stream. Uh, anyone who wants to land, it's kind of a fun airport to land at. Uh, or you can continue on to Puerto Rico, uh, which is quite a ways, but is also a very pretty airport to land at. Uh, actually, there's another. I can look it up, but just at the next island beyond actually has another pretty... All the airports in this area are pretty, to be honest. Uh, okay, so Hazel Island is just off behind us here. So it looks like this, kind of from the shore. And then that's a picture. There's some of these different buildings that are part of the island. 
so you can go and visit them if you'd like. Scuba as a, a skill, just like flying, opens up many opportunities for seeing new areas, including things like underwater karst cave formations. So when we went to visit Mammoth Cave, we talked about karst caves. Well, if you have the same sort of formations uh, that are fully submerged, then you get cave diving. So you can see this sort of thing. In particular, these are common in Florida. There are many routes of dives only available to more advanced divers. And so typically you have to move through kind of common levels of education to get those more advanced levels. I'll flash this up quick for the curious. There's beginner, I'm a beginner, advanced rescue diver, dive guide, uh, but this is sort of how they think about it. If you're curious to learn more, there's a lot of good information out there. So in summary, snorkeling and scuba diving are both great ways to explore underwater areas. Both use similar equipment, while scuba additionally needs compressed air solutions and emergency equipment and planning for going deeper underwater. Depending on the warmth of the water, a wetsuit may be required. Scuba requires certifications before going out in the ocean, but snorkeling is easy and accessible for most people. Quick uh, catch up on the chat here. I don't see what else is going on. Ah, Modaddy. Yep, that's fair. I didn't. I didn't know I had to renew it. Actually, I think mine expired. Uh, I got it when I was sixteen. So kind of similar situation. Also, Modaddy, what's the crown meaning? Oh, crown gaming. Okay, got it. I haven't seen it before. Neat. Yeah, New Blood is Trace, it is cool. It was, a, it was a fun experience. It was fun to do with a bunch of friends, too, which ended up being like a school trip. So. Okay, so we talked about scuba diving, we talked about that. Uh, of course, the most important thing to know about snorkeling and scuba diving uh, when you go out with your buddies, there are two types of people in this world, those who pee in their wetsuits and those who lie about it. Just something to keep in mind. <laughs> All right, so this is the part of the stream where Fractals usually throws up like 13 things all at once, and I talk about something else. So I'm going to quickly do this. So there's three different links that are worth checking out. Uh, so the first one here is a survey for input on the stream. So if you have suggestions or ideas, uh, things that you'd like to see change or improved, especially that voice channel idea, uh, that would be a great place to put that sort of feedback. The second one here is a link for uh, Discord community if you want to come hang out. It's always, always a blast. And then Twitter, if you're just looking for notifications about the stream, I'll post about where we're going and, and kind of some pictures there. The other piece, we'll let people vote on real quick, is our next national park. So what park are we exploring next time? There's Olympic National Park, Lake Clark National Park, and then Wind Cave National Park. It's good folks a second to vote on that one. While people are voting there, the person of this week is Lawrence Rockefeller. So we've had Rockefellers come up in a couple of different, different national parks. Lawrence Rockefeller, this fella, also this fella. Uh, so why, why Lawrence Rockefeller for this park? In 1956, Lawrence Rockefeller's nonprofit conservation organization donated its extensive lands on St. John Island to the National Park Service under the condition that the island had to protect them from future development. The remaining portion, the Keneal Bay Resort, operates on lease arrangement with the with National Park Service, which owns the underlying land. So there's actually a resort on the National Park land that used to be Lawrence Rockefeller's vacation getaway place, basically. Now it's a resort you can go and stay at if you'd like. So Lawrence Rockefeller lived from 1910 to 2004. He was an American businessman financier, philanthropist, and conservationist. Rockefeller was the son of John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Abby Rockefeller. As a trustee of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, he provided venture capital for Intel, Apple Computer, and many other successful startups. Rockefeller was known for his involvement in wilderness preservation, ecology, and the protection of wildlife. His crusade was the establishment of a conservation ethic, and he was declared America's leading conservationist by Lady Bird Johnson. A little bit about Lawrence Rockefeller. All right, we're having a pretty close tie here. We'll see if anyone else comes in with a, a last minute vote. Otherwise we do a, a wife gets to decide the tiebreaker. May need the exclamation. Oh uh, yeah, thank you Nevado's Trace. That would be a classic Fractals one, so thanks for the catch. Uh, so Mad Wisman Girl, you gotta do exclamation point vote. Uh, so the exclamation point tells the bot to 
recognize it as something that needs to happen. All right, so a little sign off while, while we finish up the votes here. Today we talked about uh, Virgin Islands National Park. We talked a little bit about hurricanes and scuba diving and snorkeling. And then we finished with Lawrence Rockefeller. I posted that uh, survey link in the chat as well as links to the Discord community. Uh, if you want to come hang out, it's fun. We talk about flying, national parks, Microsoft Flight, Microfly, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, those sorts of things. Uh, always a good time. And hey, look at that, Mad Whisperman Girl. Okay. Well, it looks like we had a pretty close one here, but our next park for uh, for next week will be Olympic National Park. That's fun. There was someone in the Discord who mentioned they were excited about that one too, so that worked out pretty well. I'm excited then to explore Olympic National Park with you all next week. And with that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. See you all next week.